Father, we give you thanks, praise, and glory for the privilege of uh, ministry uh, through the study of the Word. We bless your name. Uh, we empty ourselves vessels for your use. We ask that you anoint your people with eyes to see and ears to hear. Anoint your servant with your word as we empty ourselves vessels for your use. Yield to your Holy Spirit and trust you for the results of this evening. Amen. Satan, we bind you all territorial spirits, a strong man. All spirits not of the Holy Spirit. All spirits of witchcraft, Lilith, Jezebel, the Lilan, yes. uh, Antichrist, Python, yes. Belial, accidents, har all spirits of harm, all spirits of religion, all spirits not of the Holy Spirit. We're loosed, you're cast out, you're bound up, you're bound off, and we bind you all up and off from any form of retaliation and counterattack and decree such permanently and immediately, completely and continually forbidden to or through any individual organization, adversary, or would-be adversary from this day, every day past, any day to come. In the name of Christ Jesus, by the blood of Christ Jesus, the saints said in agreement. Amen. 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 We continue uh, our discussion of the spirit of Lilith and the Lilan, uh, and we have used as our proof text uh, Isaiah chapter 34, verse 14. And we continue our discussion now using the uh, proof text as our jumping off point. Read it along with me, if you will. And the desert creatures shall meet with the wolves. The hairy goat also shall cry to its kind. Yes, the night monster shall settle there and shall find herself a resting place. Now, some of your translations do not say night monster. Some of your translations say night hag. Some of your translations say screech owl, okay? In the actual Hebrew, the word is lilith, okay? And the lilith spirit was called in Sumerian, Hebrew, and uh, uh, Assyrian mythology, the screech owl, the night hag, or the night monster. And that's why this terminology was used here, because uh, the Holy Spirit knew that the Hebrew people were familiar with it. <coughs> okay? And so for that reason, uh, it was used. Okay? Now, in our last discussion, we talked about the fact that mythology is nothing more than demonic revelation to uh, unsaved men. And that these spirits were, although they are mentioned in the Bible along with the satyr, which is one of the uh, four daughters of Lilith, one of the Lilan, uh, and, uh, we mentioned that uh, even the satyr is mentioned in a number of scriptures uh, uh, throughout the Old Testament, and I gave you those references in our last session, and you can look those up if you would like to. Okay? We said that the vampire belongs to the class of earth elementals. And tonight, we want to go on with the teaching, and I want to uh, give you a classification which will help your understanding of these very common spirits that are totally, uh, are almost totally disregarded by uh, the end time church. Uh, okay, firstly you have the idea that vampires suck blood, okay, and, and you get that from the Hollywood movies uh, and the things like that. Those types are called sanguinarians, uh, okay, and the three types of sanguinarians uh, that you would ordinarily see in deliverance ministry would be the classical or mythical type, the inherited or generational type, okay, or the acquired, those that uh, are picked up by dabbling, okay. Now that's probably one of the more common types. Right now in California they're having a real tough time in some other states uh, teenagers picking up these uh, spirits and uh, uh, have covens or vampire clubs the way witches 
have covens or clubs. Uh, and many of these uh, folks are breaking into blood banks to get at the blood to drink the blood. And uh, so it's become a real uh, police problem in California. It's become a social problem there, and it certainly has become a spiritual problem there as well. The, uh, one of the uh, ways you can uh, tell when you have someone come for ministry to uh, get deliverance from vampirism. Uh, one of the ways you can tell whether they have inherited or acquired uh, vampirism as far as being uh, uh, a, uh, a blood feeder or a sanguinarian is concerned is to get their history of how they started, okay? These things are not unknown to psychiatrists or psychologists. They also are aware, okay, that these things exist. As a matter of fact, here in the United States, uh, psychiatrists and psychologists refer to uh, acquired vampirism as Renfield's syndrome. Renfield's syndrome. Okay, and most of these people, the way you can identify them, most of these people will start out, okay, uh, with what's called stage one Renfields, which is uh, they start out by eating insects. Then as they progress and they get worse, okay, they go to stage two, which is eating small animals. Then from there they go to stage three, which is eating large animals, and from there they go to stage four where they start attacking humans and robbing blood banks, okay? And that is a very distinct pattern you see with people who uh, have a sanguinarian vampire spirit, a blood drinker spirit, okay? And that's one type of vampirism, okay? I don't know, some of you, I don't know whether uh, some of you remember, I can't remember who the rock star was, uh, but they'd show him on television periodically biting off the head of a rat. You ever see that guy? Yes, that was yes. disgusting. Yes. Yes. You see? Was that Ozzy Osbourne that used to do that? Uh, okay, and he would bite. Okay, that's uh, stage two Renfield syndrome. Okay, that's stage two Renfield syndrome. Okay? Now, uh, all right, uh, the second type of vampire spirit is the life force energy feeder. Okay, these are the ones that sap you of energy. These people feel tired all the time. Okay, these are psychic vampires. They are in the soul life of man, and they affect uh, your soul energy. Okay, uh, their energy sappers are what they are. This is what is called psychic vampirism, a second type. Okay, and there are two types. One are intentional, and the other are unintentional. Some people just dabble, give themselves over to these spirits intentionally. Okay, they want to identify with them. They're usually people who are in the occult. Okay? The unintentional psychic uh, vampirism is that which is hereditary. They've got a family history of people who are tired all the time. Okay? Uh, or it's generational, generational curse. And when it is unintentional, these people usually take this stuff on by dabbling in the New Age, dabbling in Eastern religions, the things of Eastern religions, uh, dabbling in witchcraft, the things of witchcraft, etc. Okay, through either, uh, it's a seduction through ignorance or curiosity, uh, in other words, okay? A third type of vampire spirit is what's called a role-playing vampire. And these uh, are the kids and teenagers that you see who get into these uh, vampire groups, vampire clubs, and things like that that are so popular uh, in uh, uh, high schools in California and some of the western states. Uh, we're beginning to see some of that here in uh, Florida. Uh, it's becoming more and more common because the vampire spirit is one of the most common spirits around. Vampires and elementals in general are probably two of the most disregarded <coughs> spirits in the deliverance ministry. Okay? Uh, 
so the role-playing vampire is a third type that you see, okay, that comes on these kids through mm -hmm. curiosity and identification. All right? Uh, and that's a form of a psychic vampire also. And then there's the sexual vampire, which is the incubus and the succubus spirit that we talked about, one of the four Lyman. And the uh, sexual vampire uh, types are either intentional or non-intentional. Some are given over to this stuff because they're in witchcraft. That would be intentional vampirism. And the other type uh, are those who are not, but they get attacked during the night. Okay, And when uh, an incubus or a succubus comes on someone, the person, when they come for counseling, will very commonly tell you, uh, I felt like something was on top of me during the night. I felt like I was being held down spread eagle and I couldn't move. I felt like I wanted to cry out or say something, but I lost my voice. Uh, okay, Or I felt like something was trying to penetrate me sexually. Okay, and it might be a female sexual uh, vampire, uh, uh, a succubus, attacking a male and arousing the male during the sleep. Or it might be an incubus, which is a male sexual vampire trying to penetrate a female during their sleep. And uh, it's very, very common. Uh, many people have direct recall. They see it as a night vision. Now, remember that the night vision is what the Bible calls a dream, huh? Okay? And it's very <coughs> vivid to them. Okay? So vivid to them that sometimes they can even remember the uh, sexual feeling and stimulation. Okay? It has been traditionally taught that the incubus and succubus are two distinct forms of spirit. They are not. The incubus and the succubus is one spirit, and it's one spirit because all vampire spirits, like all werewolf spirits, or uh, lycanthropy spirits, if that's the appropriate term for them, are changelings or form changers. It changes its appearance to female. It changes its appearance to, to male, so that all vampires are changelings. Okay, uh, I told you before, I don't like to use that word changeling, because it's a new age term. I'd rather use a shape changer or a form changer, uh, which is more accurate and uh, not taking on witchcraft lingo, uh, okay, or expressions uh, in that term, okay? Then there's a type of vampire that is called the symbiotic vampire, okay? You know what symbiosis is in nature and biology? Symbiosis in biology is where uh, an organism lives off of another organism and uh, it gives off waste products from living off of the other organism and those waste products can be used by the organism that it's living off of to be ingested and it can get life from that. So their lives support each other. That's called symbiosis, okay? Uh, and it's a process that occurs in biology, in nature. Plants supporting plants, animals supporting animals, okay? Uh, that way, there are life systems supporting the other life systems. That's called symbiosis, S-Y-M-B-I-O-S-I-S. -S. Okay, well, in vampirism, there is a type of vampirism that is called symbiotic vampirism, Okay, and this is a type of vampirism where two people have vampire spirits. Okay, they usually know it. They're usually dabblers in the occult. Okay, and they, uh, the spirits use the two people to feed off of each other. So they draw off of, off of each other psychically. Okay, that is as far as their soul <coughs> power, our, uh, their soul power is concerned. And one of the types uh, of these vampire spirits uh, are called crossbreeds or nightbreeds. And these are the types that I believe are described in Revelation chapter 9, verse 7, 11 that we discussed um, uh, in our last session. And uh, uh, although it is uh, only my opinion, uh, <coughs> please keep in mind that the reason I shared that with you last week 
and looking at the symbolism of uh, Revelation 9, verses 7 to 11, is because all of those symbols are found in uh, Greek, uh, Persian, Sumerian, Assyrian, and Hebrew mythology associated with Lilith in the Lilith. Okay? Okay, let's look at the signs and symptoms of vampirism. That is, uh, what is their ministry? When they are there on board, what do they produce in people? Any or all of the following, and this is in general characteristic to most of those vampire spirits that we talked about. So that when someone comes and gives you this kind of a history, you know what you're dealing with. Okay, you can recognize it. Okay, and here are some of the things that these people will tell you. One, easy fatigability. They get tired very easily. Even shortly after waking, they feel like they have to nap several times during the day. Okay? Uh, dislike for bright lights or sunlight. Very frequently they wear uh, uh, sunglasses inside. Okay? Anemia for which a doctor cannot find a cause is another suspected thing. Preference for night activities, particularly through the night. Okay? And insomnia. These are very characteristic because vampire spirits are night spirits. Okay? Physical weakness over time for which no medical cause can be found. They're tired all the time. Don't know why. Okay? A slow death process over time for which no medical cause can be found. We were once called, uh, Rudy and I were once called to a children's hospital here to see a young boy uh, in the intensive care unit who was dying and the doctors could not find the cause. And they had no idea what was wrong with this kid. Doctor t said to us, you know, we don't know what this is, but we know that uh, whatever it is, if something's not done, this boy's going <coughs> to die. Uh, come to find out, uh, there was a witch who was a friend of the family, didn't tell the family that she was a witch, okay? And she had uh, put an assignment on the kid. And when we had discerned this, and she had him surrounded with a bunch of toy animals, which were cursed objects. And we took them off of the bed, put them away, broke all that stuff off of the kid. Uh, she got furious, stormed out of the intensive care unit because we took the animals away. Uh, told the mother she wasn't coming back anymore, ran essentially from us. And we knew she was a witch because when we invited her to pray, she wouldn't pray with us. Okay, we broke the curses off of the kid. Uh, commanded the spirits away and the next morning he was out of his coma and he was talking. See? And uh, that was a vampire spirit. See? And uh, you treat him like any other spirit. It's not something you're afraid of or anything like that. You just command them away in the name of Jesus. Bind them, break their power, loose yourself and cast them out in the name of Jesus. I cast you out in the name of Jesus. Binding Satan first, all in Christ Jesus' name, go. Don't come back, ever, in Christ Jesus' name. See? And that's the way you deal with them. You cast them out. You don't let them hang around, okay? Uh, okay, uh, the ninth sign, a progressive weakening of the will and Ill inability to fight what is happening to them. Their will starts to get weak. Very, very common. I had a pastor tell me, that uh, he was being subjected to a succubus uh, spirit. And this female sexual vampire would come on him during the night. And this pastor told me that when this spirit <coughs> would come and attack, it would weaken his will, and it was almost irresistible. See? And uh, so then it would start attacking after uh, the pastor would fall asleep. Okay, and the more frequently it would come to have that sexual activity, uh, the more he began to like it, and the more uh, the more his will would get weak. 
to the point where he finally had little or no will, and the Holy Spirit spoke to him. And the Holy Spirit, he, and he said to me, he says, one night, he says, when it was coming, the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and he says, you're fellowshipping with a vampire spirit. And he says, you better stand and resist. And then he came to his senses, and when it would approach, he started to bind it and resist it. And finally, it stopped coming, and he regained his composure. See, because the purpose is not sex. See, it's a mis conception to think that uh, the incubus and succubus is a sexual spirit. It's a sexual vampire <coughs> spirit, which means that its purpose is not sexual. Its purpose is to draw soul power, to draw energy from the person. That's what makes them tired all the time. Oh. So you see? And if it can do that, it can keep the will weak so that other spirits can minister to the person, they can build a stronghold. See? You see how they operate? Because they reinforce each other, right? That's why in Ecclesiastes it says the threefold cord is not easily broken because spirits work in threes. See? Okay? All right, what else will we see? Uh, preoccupation with death uh, or dying. Uh, the sexual attacks can come in the form of night attacks. They can come in the form of fondling, with or without sex acts. Or they can come in the form of fatigue after sex. Okay? Uh, twelfth characteristic of the presence of vampire spirits is the history of sexual abuse. Very common. Okay? Thirteen, the presence of leukemia. There are three diseases that mimic vampirism, okay? Chronic intermittent porphyria, P-O-R-P-H-Y-R-I-A, which is a metabolic disease. Leukemia, okay? And uh, certain anemias, okay? Those three diseases all uh, mimic vampirism. Okay? And are associated with vampire spirits. Very frequently you will see these in families uh, who have generational vampirism, generation's curse of vampirism, which by the way is the first thing you should always look out for when you have a person <coughs> who you know has vampire spirits. Okay, first thing you've got to determine is, is there anyone else in the family that's affected this way? And if they are, okay, you want to break that generation's curse first before you cast that out, okay? Uh, okay, wasting away for which no medical cause can be found. Very typical, the life energy, see the life force, the soul life is being drawn out of the person, Okay. Chronic fatigue in the wives of pastors is a frequent presentation of spiritual attack of vampires. They have a uh, predilection for targeting the wives of pastors. Okay, sometimes they're diagnosed as having chronic immune fatigue syndrome. There is no such thing as chronic immune fatigue syndrome. Okay, it's vampirism is what it is. Okay, and when you get that kind of a history in a pastor's wife, okay, think of vampirism because what the spirits are doing is they're keeping the pastor's wife so drained and so energyless, okay, that the pastor has to spend time taking care of her, nursing her, doing his duties, which draws him away from his obligations in ministry. See how it works? Okay? And so that's why they so frequently attack pastors, uh, wives, and families. Okay? So chronic fatigue, need to wear sunglasses all the time, indoors or out, is another feature. Frequent use of dark or black lipstick or makeup. Very common among teenagers. Okay? Uh, a lot of those plum shades or things like that. Extremely high correlation between that and people who have vampire spirits. 
Many of the young people who come in here who have vampire spirits and get deliverance, when they come to us the first time, okay, very frequently, they've got black lipstick or dark purple lipstick, okay, or that type of eye makeup or rouge, okay? Very high correlation between that and having vampire spirits, okay? Um, keeping of grave dirt around the house or in the room. Used to see this um, uh, particularly among the Mexicans in uh, the Midwest when I lived in the Midwest. And uh, in the uh, town where we lived, it was very common among the uh, Mexican Americans there, or even the Mexican migrants there, to have a bag, paper bag filled with grave dirt in their house. Say, and uh, they would uh, do that all the time. We had to encourage them to get it out of the house. <laughs> okay. And, and these were the very houses that had problems with spirits, too. Uh, and uh, couldn't understand why. The one family that had the bag of, of grave, I, I couldn't get them to get rid of it. Okay. And they didn't want to get rid of it. And finally, one time, the uh, spirits started to manifest. And uh, they lived in a trailer, okay? And the spirits started to pick up knives in the kitchen. These knives started floating through the air. And then the spirits started to throw knives at them, okay? And after two or three nights of this, they became terrorized. And one night they ran over to the church, okay? Uh, and, uh, and were screaming in fear. And we said, well, what's the matter? And they said... Knives are flying through the room trying to hit us. We can't go into our trailer anymore, see? And, and so we had to send people over there to clean uh, the place of cursed objects and take the grave dirt and everything else out, as I recall, uh, you know, and get rid of that stuff. Because what you do is you give them a license. You know, it, by your willingness to possess that stuff, you give the enemy a license to act. Say to be there, right? Joshua 7, 13. Unless you get the cursed thing out from under your midst, you cannot stand against your enemy, right? Who's your enemy? Satan, right? Okay. Uh, okay, and then uh, be um, aware that some of these teenagers will go to the dentist, and this is another sign. They will go to the dentist and they will go to a cosmetic dentist a dentist who specializes in cosmetic dentistry, and they will ask to have their teeth filed, okay? Uh, or uh, they will buy fangs to wear, okay? Uh, and this is particularly common among the teenagers, all right? And that's another sign of vampirism. So uh, when uh, you get a history like that from these people that come on into your office, you don't have to have each and every one of these things present. Okay, but if you have more than one of these things present, all right, it ought to raise a red flag in your mind to the possibility that that's what's going on here. What do you do then? You find out if there's a family history, right? Uh, you uh, deal with the generation's curse. Okay, and then you bind Satan, the spirit, the, the Satan, the strong man, the spirit, the vampire spirit. You loose yourself or the person and you command them to leave in the name of Jesus. Right? You do deliverance. Okay? Now, let me just mention to you that in the signs and symptoms, I said to you uh, that there were three diseases that have uh, the characteristic of vampirism. Okay? Uh, three characteristics of vampires is that, number one, they are a foreign invader. Number two, they attack the blood. Number three, they produce weakness. Okay? And the three diseases I mentioned to you, leukemia, porphyria, and anemia, are all foreign invaders to the body. They all attack the blood, and they all produce weakness. So these three medical diseases have the same characteristics as vampirism, okay? Oh, I'm sorry. 
let me add two others. AIDS and chronic immune fatigue syndrome, okay? Although chronic immune fatigue syndrome may not affect the blood. But I want you to be aware of those things. If you hear someone come in for counseling and they mention those words uh, in the course of conversation, okay, that would raise a flag, wouldn't it? Huh? Chronic immune fatigue syndrome, yeah. What about SARS? Don't know. Don't know. Okay? Okay, now how do you handle these things? Uh, you bind Satan first. You bind uh, the ruler spirit of the strong man. You bind the spirit of infirmity of the disease. You bind the spirit of death. You bind the vampire spirit. You loose the person. You command the spirit out. You break their threefold cord. Okay? Knowing that they work uh, in threes. That's Ecclesiastes 4.12. Okay, so the threes that usually would work to make the person weak would be the spirit of infirmity of whatever it is they've got, the death spirit and the vampire spirit, okay? You loose the person, you command them out in the name of Christ Jesus, and you bind up and off all counterattack and retaliation from all of your loved ones and yourself, your ministries and their peoples, and from all that you are, have, and possess permanently, immediately, completely, continually, and all in Christ Jesus' name. The last thing I want to mention to you in regard to the vampire spirit is uh, some medical diseases which are associated with human blood-drinking vampires, the sanguinarian types that we mentioned earlier. Okay? If you medically examine these people, you will discover that they frequently have uh, one or more of the following diseases. Okay, chronic immune fatigue syndrome, diabetes, insomnia, lupus, migraines, porphyria, photosensitivity, catalepsy, pemphigus, or a dental disease called hypohydrotic ectodermal dysplasia. You don't have to remember that. Okay, it's just the dentist's word for fangs. <laughs> okay. Hypohydrotic ectodermal dysplasia. Okay, that's the, uh, that's the uh, uh, dental medical term for fangs or vampire fangs. Okay. <laughs> Okay, and by the way, uh, just as a little side note, uh, vampirism, you see, represents a perversion of the natural order of things, doesn't it? Right, just like the spirit of perversion has perverted nature, right? So animals which at first never killed or ate each other, now kill and eat each other. Say, why? Because nature, the whole creation has been perverted, right, because of sin in the fall. Okay, well, just as a point of interest, that is also true of the plant kingdom. We have plants that eat insects, right, and things like that. Okay, and believe it or not, uh, vampirism also exists in the plant kingdom. Okay, and all plants of the order Homoptera of the plant kingdom are vampiric. Okay, indicating that Satan has even perverted nature. See, these are vampiric plants. Okay? Now, um, I just want to go on since uh, we've got a little time here. Give me, can I have 10 more minutes? Okay? I want to uh, talk about a uh, spirit which is closely related to the vampire spirit, and that is the spirit of lycanthropy, okay? The lycanthrope spirit. Lycanthropy is the uh, term for werewolf or werebeings, okay? The werewolf spirit or the werebeings, 
spirit. There are more than just werewolves. What you will discover, is, and I'll tell you that, there are werewolves, werebats, were-rats, were-tigers, and were-locusts, and were-insects of other types, believe it or not. Okay? They are all recognized as spirits in the different mythologies of different cultures. Okay? So they all fall under the class of uh, spirits of lycanthropy. They behave mostly like vampires. They, the vampires, remember, are shape changers or uh, are uh, form changers, so they can change into the spirit of lycanthropy. That is, they can appear that way. Okay? Uh, and they can also change into other were beings. Form changers are morphing spirits. The word morphology, you may have heard that term in science. In the science of medicine, morphology is the study of form and change of anatomy. Okay? So these are what we call morphing spirits. They change their appearance or their, their shape or form. Okay, shapeshifters is another term. Changeling shapeshifters or uh, form shifters are new age terms. Uh, we call them form changes. They practice human to animal transformation or morphing. Okay? And here's a little clue about binding uh, them and loosing them. When you bind them, you must also bind them uh, from uh, shape-shifting or form-changing in Jesus' name. Okay? Because they're legalists, and they'll use the name-changing or the form-changing as a legal ground to resist coming out. See? They're identifying with their changed identity. So then you're calling them by the wrong thing. That's the way they operate. You see? Okay? All right. Let me make you aware of holidays and saints' days which are associated with werewolves or lycanthropy. All right? The, the source is J. Lewis Martin, Doctor of Divinity, Professor Emeritus of Biblical Theology at Union Theological Seminary. And he points out that Halloween, uh, the Catholic Feast of the Annunciation, uh, which is a Catholic holiday, and St. Paul's Day, which is a Protestant holiday, uh, okay, are all associated with uh, worshiping of the spirit of lycanthropy or werewolves. Uh, he points out that uh, similar to the denominational practice of naming church buildings after so-called saints, behind which a demonic ruler spirit over the church hides, having a legal ground against the members of the congregation who willingly submit to church authority authorized by the flesh of men with a little help from Satan, the willful sin of denominational uh, works the work of the religious spirit. Okay? All right, when should you suspect vampirism in a person you're counseling with? Okay? If they have any family or personal histories of any of the following. These are all things which many, many cultures hold uh, as truth, mythological truths associated with vampirism, okay? And the mythologies of all of these cultures, mainly the Eastern European cultures, Assyrian, Romanian, Bulgarian, uh, Greek especially, uh, some of the Italian cultures and, and Latin cultures, uh, the Assyrian, the Hebrew, the... Um, uh, Sumerian cultures. I've even questioned people from Haiti and found these things are believed in, uh, by some Haitians who know about them. <clears throat> okay, so 
this is almost ubiquitous. That is in all cultures worldwide. Okay? And, and uh, in their mythology, remember, mythology is demonic revelation to the unsaved. And therefore, it exists as belief in their cultures, and this is their be these are their beliefs of what will happen to the unsaved, how Satan will use the unsaved, okay, as vampires if they die unsaved, okay? And here's the things that are taught in these cultures. One, who, who will, and so you have to ask to see if they've got a family history of this because you got to presume that that's how Satan will attack because he's a legalist and he'll want to claim what he believes in okay even though we know that uh, you know it's all bulldog right okay but he doesn't think that way and we need to protect the people who have no knowledge because we because we don't uh, think that way it isn't going to stop Satan from going after them is it you see what I mean that's why we need to know these things, okay? All right, so many cultures hold that the following unsaved will become vampires according to mythological tradition, which is what? Satan's plan, right? Suicides, excommunications, dying unbaptized in one of his churches, being a sorcerer, a witch, or a werewolf, okay? Very common... Uh, in uh, Eastern European countries and in Greece. Parents cursing their children with the words, may the earth reject you. Okay? And when they speak that curse over their children, okay, Satan lays claim over the unsaved souls of those children to become vampires after death. Okay? Having red hair or red hair with blue eyes. In many cultures, this is a sign of uh, the person being predestined to vampirism. Okay? A cat, an animal, or a child crossing over a corpse. Okay? A victim of an unavenged murder. Being a seventh son in a family. Seventh son, offspring, in a family. A person born between December 25th and January 6th, Satan would claim for vampirism. Being sexually promiscuous. Okay? Offspring of demon seed, Genesis 6.1. Okay, that refers to the giants of the earth, like the uh, Nephilim, the Raphaim. Do you remember that? Uh, a bite by a vampire or a drink, or drinking the blood of a vampire. Okay, I have some photos, some slides of psychic vampirism. Uh, I have uh, one of a child with hereditary vampirism has fangs. Uh, I've got a photo, a slide of uh, a, a person uh, who had, uh, I believe it was psychic vampirism or an uh, incubus succubus attack during the sleep who has pierce marks on the neck here equidistant, three of them. And if you measure them, they're perfectly equidistant from each other so you know that this is not mosquito bites. Right. See? <laughs> Okay, and I've got photographs of that also, and then I've got some photographs of other stuff that represent psychic vampirism. So we actually have this stuff photographically documented uh, in our archives uh, here. Okay, so the bite of a vampire, or drinking blood of a vampire. Keep in mind that what Satan has taught unbelievers is binding for those who die in his grasp, right? Okay? And that's why we need to know this stuff. Okay? So uh, I believe that that gives you an overview. Okay? What is the spiritual remedy? In all of this series, we've talked about spiritual remedies. These folks almost always need deliverance. Okay? So the first thing we do is we give them the gospel. 
right? If they're not saved, we transfer them out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Where God's plan for their life can take over, Satan's plan for their life ends immediately and completely. Uh, that's the first thing. The second thing we do, uh, okay, is we build them up in faith. Okay, so that they can take possession of their healing and their deliverance. Third thing you must do is question them for any of the different signs of vampirism to see if they are present in more than one member of the family line and particularly in more than one generation. Because if they are, you want to get rid of the generation's curse first because that's a legal ground for these spirits to stay. Okay? Uh, you break the generation's curse... Okay, you find out if any of those conditions exist in their family lines, okay, that we associate with vampirism, and you repent of the ancestors for those things and break those conditions off of the family's lines in the name of Christ Jesus by the blood, uh, acknowledging by the generation's cursed prayer that in so doing they grieved the Holy Spirit and acted in hostility to the Father, repenting for them and asking the Lord's forgiveness and repenting for themselves uh, for anything they did in repeating these things. Okay? Asking for restitution for those who were harmed uh, by uh, asking the Lord to make their descendants born again, spirit-filled, water-baptized, and uh, uh, in covenant in Jesus' name. And then breaking the uh, soul ties, bonds, cords, and ties with those curses, with those sins, and with those spirits, all in Jesus' name. And after you do that, you break the generation's curse of vampirism in the name of Christ Jesus, by the blood of Christ Jesus. You do the same if there's lycanthropy present. Lycanthropy, vampirism, usually come in the form of night visits when spirits attack. Okay? Uh, and uh, you simply command them away in the name of Jesus. Okay? Uh, and uh, remember that when Isaiah 34, 14 refers to the night monster or the night hag, okay, today we would ordinarily encounter those spirits uh, during our sleep or during the night, and we would tend to refer to them as night visitors huh? or night trespassers, okay? What you have to understand is that the Old Testament, Isaiah 34, 14, was written in a language of 2,000 years ago, okay? Today we would be considering these spirits from the viewpoint of being spiritual trespassers, okay, <coughs> or spiritual... Um, uh, night visitors, and we just simply command them away in the name of Christ Jesus. Do not be afraid. Do not be fearful. Remember that they, everything they do, they do by bluffing. They were defeated at the cross by Jesus. Their power was taken away from them by Jesus. You do not have to fear them. Okay? All you have to do is bind them, loose yourself or the other person, and cast them out in the name of Christ Jesus. Command them not to return. All in Jesus' name. So the next step would be deliverance. Huh? Okay? And then what you want to do is you want to be sure that the person perceives that something left them. And they feel different. And if they did get their deliverance, their strength will come back. Okay? The behaviors of vampirism will disappear. Okay, they will no longer take an interest in those things that they took an interest in before. The behaviors associated with vampires will no longer be there. Okay, they will be sleeping well at night. Okay, they will be behaving differently. So you look to see what? For transformation, signs of change. Okay, and if you do not see signs of change, they're still tired. Things are still going on. You just persist in deliverance until you get the uh, deliverance, the effect that you're, uh, that you're seeking by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will deliver. It's as simple as that. The work of the cross is finished. Okay? Spirits have to obey anything commanded them in the name of Christ Jesus. They don't have a choice. 
Luke 10, 17. Even the demons obey us in your name. Um, amen? amen? Okay? So your final step then would be deliverance and casting away. And then you would follow them up, okay, over a period of weeks or months to see how they're doing. Okay? And uh, most important uh, in your final steps in remedy is you must get them into the word of God and you must get them into prayer. Because remember what Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew. Once the spirit leaves, Jesus said, seeing that its house is clean or empty, it says, I will return to my house, bringing seven worse with it, so that the end condition of the person was worse <coughs> than the beginning. See? So you've got to be sure that these folks are willing, once they get deliverance, to stay in the word and to stay in prayer every day. Because that's what fills the empty house and keeps the spirits away because they can't stand the word of God and they can't stand prayer. See? And that keeps people free. Amen? Amen. Amen. The Lord will give you thanks, praise, and glory for uh, uh, the spirit of uh, wisdom and the spirit of revelation. We give you thanks, praise, and glory, uh, Lord, that uh, your word is true. As you said in uh, Job, that you reveal to man the deep things of darkness, the deep things of Satan, Lord. And you said through Paul, we are not ignorant of the wiles of the devil. We give you thanks and praise and all the glory. The saints said in agreement. Amen. Amen. Anybody want to ask questions? Uh, um, yes. The vampiric spirits. It may be and it may not be. Okay? I would not say, I would not draw the conclusion that codependent people, do you know what codependence is? Codependence is a uh, solical problem in marriage, or what a psychologist or psychiatrist would call a psychological problem within people's married lives where two people, instead of both being secure in Christ and centered in Christ, living their marriage for each other and to each other and through each other as servants, servanthood is the model that Christ gives us, right? Instead of that, they are living their marriage where each of them are living off of each other's strengths <coughs> and weaknesses. That's called codependence. Okay. Them, yeah, and they're and, and they're taking away from each other to survive. See, right. is that a point a, a type of vampirism? Well, maybe it is. Say, uh, it, it really creates a hardship in marriages. Those marriages are very difficult to survive until each person gets centered in Christ. But my point to you is, excuse me, that just because codependency is there does not mean necessarily that that's vampirism, okay? But if you have a codependent couple and there are other signs of vampirism present with it, associated signs, Okay, then I would be suspicious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you mean codependent? Just what I said. Two people live off of each other's strengths and weaknesses. Oh, example. Huh? Example. Okay. For instance, mm -hmm. uh, when you have a codependent personality, uh, that person may be insecure. Okay? Mm -hmm. That person uh, may be... Um, uh, easily intimidated. That person may be fearful. Okay? That person may feel rejected by the partner. Okay? But when they see the partner fail at something, okay, it strengthens them and they react in such a way that they get a gratification of seeing that person put down or fail. See, because that person is always picking up. Do you see? So they draw a strength yeah. from the other person's failure. Okay? Yes. See, that's that's codependency. See, it's a dysfunctional way of surviving. Right, that's, that's see? an ego-centered... Yeah, it's a dysfunctional way of surviving. 
See, living off of each other's strengths and weaknesses. Did you see that in the world of or, or just the other way, rather than to get strength from someone else's weakness. Mm -hmm. Okay? If they're weak, they'll draw from someone else's strength. Okay. Say, no, I can't do this. You do it for me. Okay? That's codependency. Or they depend on the other party for their happiness and their... Yeah. They have to wait on this person for, yeah. for their moods to change. In other words, yeah. watch for that person to see if, you know, if they're going to be happy because that person is happy. Right. And then when they turn it around, they, mm -hmm. it turns them around. Mm -hmm. it's, it's incredible. It, it, Any it, other questions? Yeah, you're yes. saying about um, names, saints, saints, different saints. Yes. You know, my stepmother named all her kids, five boys, with the saints, a different saint, in their name, uh -huh. one of them. Um, would that affect them? Different Don't know. That's a, that's a Cuban thing. If you're born, yeah. like but she, you know, she, she just thought it was a good thing to do. I that's a European thing, to name people yeah, after yes, saints yeah. also. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for the most part, uh, it's a ploy of the enemy. Uh, you know, for instance, very commonly uh, in the Haitian culture, the Cuban culture, the islands cultures, mm -hmm. that uh, when the uh, slaves came over from Africa, in Western Africa, mm -hmm. and they brought uh, with them the names of their nature spirits, mm -hmm. right? And then they got uh, brought into the Catholic Church in uh, the islands here in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. uh, or in Cuba, or in Jamaica, and things like that. And the uh, Catholic priests would not let them uh, worship nature spirits. That they simply covered for them mm -hmm. and put saints' names on the nature spirits, right? So San Lazaro, Santa Barbara, Saint Barbara or San Lazaro really represent demonic spirits or nature spirits that are worshipped in Santeria, you know, or in these witchcraft religions. Well, you see, Satan works that way everywhere. You see, you may, out of the goodness of your heart, as an Episcopal or a Lutheran or a Catholic, okay, want to name your local church St. Michael's, okay, or St. John's. But I promise you, Satan's got a religious spirit, okay, that's on that church, and that spirit has a real name, okay? And the name of that church is nothing but a front for the real name, see? Because that's the pattern in the kingdom of darkness. And we learn this from the different cultures. See, that's how Satan operates. So, so those kids would be affected by these names if it's in their name? I don't know. I don't know. It you see, I, don't, I, wouldn't so wor I wouldn't so much worry about whether it affects children who are named but because... No, they no, they have their own children see, and all that. Well, I, the reason why I would not, uh, I would not uh, be overly concerned about that is because New Testament Scripture says all names are given from heaven. See, for that reason, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, would you please restate the uh, prayer for the lycanthropy spirit that you said they were legal? Yeah, what, what, I, what I said was, you bind, uh, the, the question is, uh, how do you bind uh, a uh, shape-changing or a morphing spirit? Okay, uh, a vampire that is a shape-changer or a form-changer. Uh, uh, what you simply just do is, you say, spirit of vampirism, I bind you, and I bind you from changing, uh, or from form-changing in the name of Jesus. That's all. Say. From, from change, shape, from, and form changing. Shape changing or form changing. In the name of Jesus. Yeah, I bind you from doing that. In Jesus' name. Heavy Say. duty. Huh? Heavy duty stuff. It's heavy duty stuff. And it was on and TV last night, and guess what? She calls me. Yeah. We're talking about all kinds of different things, praying, what have you. And all of a sudden, she says to me, this, this is so awesome what happened last night. Yes, Lord. She says to me, Marty, she said, you know, and she starts telling me mm -hmm. about a guest that uh, Benny and I had on Debbie Gideon. Maybe you even saw Alice Smith. And she mm -hmm. says, do you know that this Alice Smith even sounded like Fern? And I, I got curious. I said, no kidding. So we were talking and talking. I said, you know, I'm receiving, is it 1.30? Because I think it's about 1.30. He comes on, yeah. 
But listen, I said, if it's 1.30, I said, you know what? If God wants me to listen to this and see this tonight, yeah. let it come on now. Hang up, good night, good morning, whatever. Three minutes later, she calls me up. She says, Betty Hinn is on, and it is the show. So I thought, well, glory be God, right? So I listened to this. Betty Hinn is over at 2 o'clock. So I stood in front of my closet, and I, you know, and I did exactly what the lady said when you would say, you know, ask the Holy Spirit to show you. And, you know, automatically I remembered that I had a picture of the woman that supposedly started all the problems between my ex-husband and I and eventually broke up our yeah, marriage. Sure for yeah, but listen to this, yeah, because when I was very young in my spirit and all this was starting, I got a picture of her just to see what she looked like and plus I would pray over it that she would, yeah, in my, in my innocence, but it worked, you know, that she would not be able to have a hold on him and that God would break that up in Jesus' name. So P.S., to make a long story, I said, oh my God, do I still have that picture? So I get to looking for the picture, it was in the closet, and I hear, don't do your dishes, you didn't do your dishes and forget that. I said, ha, 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 and you're not fooling me, I'm gonna find this if it takes me all night. But I did, I went to do my dishes. It's funny, you know, because I had left them and I could never go to bed with a dirty kitchen. So anyhow, I come back, I start looking all over again, then I really remembered that the, the picture had been, I had destroyed the picture. But something in my spirit kept saying, you keep looking because there's something in that closet. And I kept looking and I kept, and then, you know, I kept hearing, go do this, go do that because you haven't finished doing this or doing that. And I said, no, I'm going to see this through. Way up on the top of the closet, I guess about maybe three, four, five years ago, whenever, I had taken a little doll that was a miniature of a Barbie doll. I probably took it from Gabby's room because it gave me a message that Gabby shouldn't have it there. Always the eyes burn, like with the angels that you told me to destroy. I look at her eyes. She has false eyelashes and everything. She's a little miniature thing. Mm -hmm. And it scared the living daylights out of me. Because the woman said, Alice Smith said, we, can't, we have to be balanced. You know, we can't just assume, like you have said often, that everything in your house or, you know, some things that are really not, you know, demonic are. So anyhow, I asked the Holy Spirit, I said, is this what I'm looking for that needs to be out of this house? And I got the affirmation. I cursed it. I uprooted it. I repented for having it there without even knowing. Yeah. Did you know that I slept like a baby? But listen, it gets better. Because today, speaking to different people in our congregation, they were doing spiritual cleaning in their house without even knowing it. And there's a, a person that's praying for this other person to have their little person get rid of things in their home. The Spirit of God is upon us for real. You know, the, uh, the, uh, one of the characteristics I said is that the uh, vampire spirits, the lilith spirits, are morphing spirits, changing, uh, changing spirits. They have also changed to adapt their appearance to the cultures exactly. over They're time. Right. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> when Lilith was, uh, they become modern. When modernized. They modernized. See, when Lilith migrated to uh, Persia, she became known as Ashtaroth or Astarte. Yeah. Then over uh, to uh, Greece as Diana, yeah. to Rome as Venus. Venus. Okay, yeah. and so forth throughout. So forth throughout history. Okay. So that today, the idol that represents the Lilith spirit are the Barbie dolls and the like dolls, just like that. They're, they have bad copies now of the Barbie doll types. See, that's the New Age spirit. And in parentheses, okay. when you said that, I doubted that. I want you to know that. Yeah. And it was a confirmation last night. I said, well, my. We know. <laughs> Yeah. No, because I question, I really do. I mean, I can't just, you know, I really do. I question the spirit. What you have to know. understand is that whenever I teach something, I extremely exactly. thoroughly research it. No, but when you picked on the Barbie so, doll, I said the Barbie I, There's doll. very little that passes by me. No, no, but I so, said, how could the Barbie doll have originated the, way back in the Greek mythology? You know, I no, no, that's that, not, that has nothing to do with the Greek mythology. No. You're missing the whole no, point. No, you said they're changing No, no, no. They, it, it changes forms, right. but the reason that the Barbie doll and the like dolls are associated with Lilith is because they, the Barbie doll 
is the figure of female independence oh, okay. and of uh, female liberation. Okay, and that was the original story, the mythology of Lilith was that she was Adam's first wife. Now that is not divine revelation. No. There is no fact in scripture in that. But remember that that is mythological revelation to the unsaved. Okay, no. uh, in other words, Satan considers that truth in his kingdom, right? Oh, no. Okay, okay. And, and Satan considered Lilith Adam's first wife, and she broke away from Adam because she didn't want to be told what to do. See, so it was that female, independent feminism spirit, okay, that is rooted in Lilith. Okay, and now it comes into the new age. Uh, as uh, as Barbie, the symbol of female liberation, right, and independence. And see, I thought you were the symbol of femininity. It has nothing to do with the femininity. Yeah, no, it has to do them. with the or has to do with the origin of the myth and what the myth is doing today. Okay, the myth expresses itself today right. in the form of female liberation. The feminism movement. Okay, now Say, Gabby rejected the Barbie doll. She doesn't like the Barbie dolls, and I couldn't understand yeah. why. But listen to this. There's another one that's like a, a, a power figure, yeah. which is the power, Powerpuff Girls. Uh -huh. and she, They're all the same. But you know what? It, it's funny how they, they put it through the television because she said, Granny, there's nothing wrong with them. I said, Gabby, I don't like that. And her mother got it for her for her bed. The sheets, the pillowcases, and the comforters. And I'm, I'm, you know. You know what's on the mother, no wonder. See what's That's on the mother? What is it? The, 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 the Hulk, you know, this new movie. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the form changer. But you know what? It's amazing because she almost, you know, said it's okay. And she'll think that the Powerpuff Girls are good because they fight evil. Yeah. So you think, you know, I'm telling you what they do with the kids. Is it good? But the mother is the mother there, so you know I can only pray that you know the mother comes to her senses. But it's incredible what goes on in the Harry Potter between all oh, these please, these that's sorcery that's things. That's another thing. Uh, that's going to go on. That's two thousand and eight. They said on television where he gets in the old, and it kind of goes. He's getting so divorced. Sorcery. Did you know that? The stories are all programmed. We're recording. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know that the stories are all recording? Yeah, are we done with questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Are we done with questions? Yeah, yeah okay, you can come back. Uh, no.